Hello, Pat. Good to meet you here. Uh, my longtime friend. Yes, yeah, always enjoy to uh, chat with you. Hey, Pat, I understand that in circular economy, many companies could not start the journey, mainly because they said, hey, it would add cost to my products. My customers would never be uh, willing to, to pay for, for that. And so that becomes an obstacle, one of the obstacles that they could not get over with. I wonder if in your experience, how you were able to convince some of your customers to be able to turn this around and make it happen. Yeah, great question. How and look, apologies, we can't be together, you know, having this dialogue like we normally <laughs> do, but you know, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to travel into continental before too long and looking forward to getting back with you there again. Uh, you know, what I'm experiencing is that. Yes, everybody wants to look at design for manufacturing, design for sustainability. But coming from a services perspective, what I'm finding is that brands are looking at the refurbishment to resell the product coming back to them. Product as a service, device as a service is just growing massively. And leasing of product to use software on that product is becoming, I mean, it's on phones now. It's on high-end enterprise products. Um, those products at the end of the lease are coming back. So what we're finding is that brands are recognizing there is a residual value of the product being returned. So refurbishing it to resell it into a secondary market under the brand's name, there's actually a monetary benefit to the brand because they're creating another sales channel while avoiding that product going into landfill or being scrapped. And through that realization, we're finding that the brands are becoming more aware then of the design impact of the new products they're working on. And that they're realizing, yes, some materials may be more expensive than what they were using prior. And that may have an impact that the product is gonna be more expensive. But like we've always seen in the tech space, how you know, product values decrease. It's just the evolution of product gets cheaper. So while I think there may be a barrier in the use of more environmentally friendly materials because they're more expensive, I believe that the price point will plateau out where it will be affordable. But definitely the refurbishment is influencing the design. And there's not a brand that I'm aware of not focusing now on the design element in order to have more environmentally friendly materials, as you call it, the waste and harm element of the smiley curve. And they're realizing there's a lot of waste, there's a lot of harm, they got to design it out. That's right, yeah, I, bet. I think you're right on. Because oftentimes uh, when companies only are myopic, looking at only the product, product cost, they say, hey, it's going to cost more for my consumers. They haven't looked at the total life cycle impact. The life cycle impact is that the product actually would have residual value, right? exactly as you said. Maybe I can reuse the product, or maybe I can uh, refurbish it and sell it at a different channel. So the, the, there is value, and that value is positive value to the product. Or when the consumer use the product, they would use less electricity, or it would be more energy efficient, or maybe the consumers uh, can can use less water to uh, uh, yes. wash the product, right? So that is also positive impact. So I think we have to emphasize on this total product life cycle cost, as opposed to only the initial manufacturing cost, and that would enable uh, more companies to see circular economy is not a cost plus. No, you're absolutely right. And I think what you're saying, and I kind of look at it as a, like an a la carte menu, in essence. <laughs> material is one cost and one impact on the circular economy. How you move that product, and if you're moving it thousands of miles, as opposed to maybe in region manufacturing, where you use, you're moving it less miles or kilometers, then that actually has a big impact on the carbon footprint of that product, the physical distance that you're moving the product, which you rightly point out, take the four square walls that's being used to warehouse or manufacture the product. Are there solar panels all over the roof? Is the use of water and electricity 
being significantly compressed and reduced, again, that influences the carbon footprint of the product. So I think companies need to be mindful not to just think about the raw material in the product, not to just think about the landfill element at the end, but how you make it, where you make it, how you move it and what you're moving, because it's the sum of all those parts on the menu is what really impacts the carbon footprint. Yeah, well, and to do that well, uh, Pat, I think companies need to have a measurable way of looking at how those impacts could occur, right? In the logistics cost, in the reuse cost, in or benefits in some sense, yes. values. And so if we don't have that way to measure, then you are counting on a person's uh, trust, yeah, faith that they will be good. But if it can be measured in a concrete way, then it makes it tangible and real, which is why I like what you described about the CO2 calculator, because that is a concrete way to help people to identify what exactly could be the benefits out of this whole process. Absolutely. And we realized, I would go back two years ago, we were having a lot of conversations with customers um, about this topic. And it was, you know, a point of view discussion. And we realized, you know what, this is about data, it's about analysis, and it's about facts. And that's when we set about creating the software tools to give us the calculators, the value creation calculator around refurbished to resell, and the CO2 calculator to look at what's the impact if I put nothing into landfill. And it took us quite some time to build those tools out, but it's been a transformation because as we now look at a, a particular product, what you're now using is data analysis and fact-based measurable outcomes that completely change the conversation around reusing to resell, around recycling and avoid um, landfill. So the calculators for us have been a transformation because as I said, it's providing measurable fact-based outcomes which are invaluable for, for the customers. It's admirable that uh, you have been able to do that uh, to convince many of the customers that this is contributing so positively. I hope that one day uh, you would also extend that measurable calculator to consumers. Perhaps you are doing it already where the consumers can also see, haha, this product contributes much less carbon footprint. And therefore, even if it is 5% uh, more expensive, it's worth it. I hope that the consumers can have the same level of visibility and transparencies as well. Yeah, and I, you know how I would say, I mean, we've witnessed disruption, you know, all around us. And I am firmly of the view there's going to be a couple of brands that are going to disrupt by putting the carbon footprint of the said product they're selling, putting it broadly there on the box in front of the consumer to enable them make an informed purchasing decision. And I think it's inevitable. I know one brand that clearly is going to do that next calendar year, and there will be the trend. It's brave, but it's another form of disruption. Wow, it must be exciting uh, for, for you, I've had to be like a crusader <laughs> to, to, to help uh, to mobilize the whole industry and helping companies. But I do believe that this is such an important and valuable journey that we should all play a part. Uh, well, congratulations to what you have done, Pat. <laughs> Thanks, Ho. Thanks. No, look, it's very rewarding. It's a very good, I would say, solution for brands at the end of the day. And everything we do is about our customers and our customer's customer. That's how we're motivated. And you got to come up with solutions that benefit the customer and the customer's customer. So, you know, it's back as well, I think, to us as individuals and our own moral compass in regards to sustainability stewardship. And, you know, like I discussed with you in the past, you know, not just as business people, but as human beings, we need to do more for the environment. I think we learn a lot from, in my case, our, our, our children, who actually have a great awareness around the environment and sustainability stewardship. So, you know, it's about, I really believe, making decisions that leave the environment in a better way than, than the manner we found it. And I honestly believe the pandemic has really 
you know, sped up the agenda around environment and sustainability. And I think only good actually can come out of that because I think governments, people and companies will make commitments that they can't hide from. Wonderful. I think, yeah, so both you and I, I think, belong to the same camp. We, we are the crusaders. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, how something that we're coming across a lot is, look, our product life cycles, it's all about time and end of life, but the refurbish to resell a product and in essence, resell it where you revert that product out into the market. You know, we're seeing that there's a big appetite for that, for sure. But at the same time, you have a situation where the refurbishment of that product can cause a channel conflict for the brand in two ways. One, they got to be very thoughtful where they sell that refurbished product so it doesn't cannibalize the sale of a new product. And that's why I believe brands are taking control to refurbish, to, to, sorry, to resell the refurbished product themselves and not allow liquidators put them into a place where you don't want that product to end up. But something I came across only this week is there was product that was end of life. Even refurbished, you may not be able to resell it as much as you first thought. And I've noticed that this brand has set up a charity where they're taking refurbished PCs and they're actually donating them to you know, underprivileged you know, people that would not have the wherewithal to have their own PC. And, they learned this opportunity from the schooling from home, where, you know, in certain countries, certain parts of the world, people didn't, young kids didn't have a PC or a laptop to be educated from home. So I found that as a terrific initiative where it wasn't about revenue generation. They still avoided putting product into landfill by donating hundreds and of, of, of you know, product out to, to young kids. I just thought that was a terrific initiative fitting into circular economy in a way. Yeah, well, that's a great example, uh, Pat. I do believe that there is a cultural barrier sometimes in some sectors where people will say, well, would I want to pay for the refurbished uh, product or exactly as you described the channel conflict. But I, I think that the opportunities are there. Number one is that we are becoming a global economy. Okay, Despite all these trade frictions, I think the world is still global. And so some products, maybe the channel is limited in the, in the US or in the, some part of Western Europe, but the refurbished product would be welcome, would have big demand in Africa or in Central America. And so I think we can develop the right channels to help. And second is that we oftentimes should think from this multi-generational product lifecycle perspective, which is, the end of the product life cycle of a PC can become the components can be disassembled and it becomes part of the components to go into some other electronic devices. And it becomes a different industry in, in medical device, let's say. Uh, yeah. And after that, maybe you get the metal out and use it in the right proper way, treat it in the right proper way. And it becomes the input to another product, which is completely yeah. different from your original PC. So in that sense, we have a multi-generation product life cycle perspective and the value keep going. The value keep going so that we'll be able to see the positive side of the smiley curve in a much more extensive way. No, absolutely. And I believe, you know, the way you describe that landfill can be gold mines and it's really understanding how can you recycle everything where nothing goes into landfill. And we're certainly seeing what was unimaginable a couple of years ago materials being recycled into renewable energies, into remanufacturing, where they were never even considered in the past. So I think, honestly, we're only at the start of that smiley curve. And I think you're going to find a lot of very creative individuals and companies that are going to come up with, I think, very clever things around recycling. But that's massively going to influence the designers on what material go into the product the next wave of new products.